Welcome to Eco Ask Why, a podcast that dives into industrial manufacturing topics and spotlights the heroes that keep America running. I'm your host, Chris Granger, and on this podcast, we do not cover the latest features and benefits on products that come to market. Instead, we focus on advice and insight from the top minds of industry because people and ideas will be how America remains number one in manufacturing in the world. Welcome to Eco Ask Why. Today, we're going to be talking about an idea around how on-site services impacts industrial manufacturing. And to help walk us through this topic, we have Mr. Daniel Vaughn, who is a product service representative with Electrical Equipment. How are you doing, Daniel? Doing great, Chris. How are you? Doing good, man. I really appreciate you taking the time with us today. My pleasure. Well, let's just jump right in for our listeners here. And What are some of the typical services that industrial manufacturers utilize when we're talking about repair and remanufacturing of goods? Great question, Chris. There's a variety of services that are really included with that, but a lot of the things the customers that I deal with really look for uh, in regards to repair and remanufacturing is really helping them organize their spare parts, their broken parts, their parts that need to be repaired, and helping organize them in a way that can be actually um, tracked to be able to be sent out for repair and also returned to the proper location inside the facility where the customer can use it and be able to depend upon it as it is a good, good spare part. Okay. Now, is this specific to electrical components here? No. So within our industrial companies uh, that we work with, each of our customers have a variety of different parts, whether it's mechanical, electrical, there's quite a wide array of different parts that uh, we help with organization and repairs at our customer sites. Okay. So what, what do you see as like a typical types of items that would they be drives or control type stuff? What, I'm just trying to get paint a little bit broader picture for our listeners of what, when you say repair and, and remanufacturing, what would be some of those devices? There is really a large amount of different products that this really encompasses. But if you want to kind of get some really common items that the majority of industrial customers will want to be repaired, it would definitely include motors and drives. But with that, there's a variety of electrical and mechanical components, whether it is IC controls, whether it is a variety of different products. But definitely drives is definitely a very popular item that is repaired and remanufactured often, um, along with motors. Okay. Now, are you typically working in storerooms for these types of opportunities to help to help that industrial end user? We definitely are, Chris. Each customer is going to be different and unique and have their own operations and procedures on how they would like storerooms to be run, repairs to be managed. Uh, But with that, the majority of our customers like to keep everything centralized in one location so it's easy to track, it's easy to disperse to the teams that need those parts. And a lot of times they will put those repair remanufacturing items that whether they go down or need to be repaired or stored, it'll all be in a storeroom type solution. Okay, very good. So maybe walk us through and help us understand better the typical process flow when you're working with that industrial and user in this space here. Absolutely. One of the first things we do is we have an initial conversation uh, with our customers. We try to learn how they run their business and how we can help better support them um, as a distributor. Uh, One of the first things that we always will ask is, when a part breaks, when it, whether it's inside the machine or near the machine, what happens to that part? Is it just pulled out and thrown in the trash? Is it pulled out and just thrown on the floor? Is it thrown out and stored somewhere else? We want to know what happens when a machine goes down and when a part fails. What happens to that part? Where is it placed? Because what we are able to do at Electrical Equipment Company and other uh, distributors across the country is we're able to help them organize this process that once it's identified, as it's broken and no longer working, we can help gather that part. We can help have a central location to be able to store that location so that we can then pick it up, catalog it, and then get a quote out to the customer so they can understand uh, what their options are in the repair. So with that process, we definitely will have that conversation with the customer to learn their processes. We will then identify the parts that definitely need to be repaired and looked at and remanufactured. And we will come on a regular cadence to the customer to be able to pick up those repairs, catalog them, uh, get them quotes to see if they would like to have that part repaired. And if they would, 
we actually will pick up the part for them. We will package it. We will ship it. We will ensure and track it through the entire process, send them updates along the way on how the repair process is going. And if we need any more time or less time than what we quoted them. Um, And then we actually will hand deliver it in a designated area that the customer would like that repair part uh, with the actual warranty attached to it. Okay. Well, well, maybe help us here as well. So a couple of things that popped in mind when you're walking through that, I I typically think a lot of services from an on-site standpoint being vendor managed inventory, you know, VMI, we hear that acronym a lot in industry. Does this tie into VMI or is this typically a separate service outside of that? This is typically a separate service outside of VMI, but with all of what we call the vendor managed inventory or VMI customers we have, we like to join them as often as possible so that we do not only have a vendor managed inventory solution where we will help manage their storeroom for them and ordering and stocking, but we will also help them in the repair needs. So we see these services as a complement to each other and that they really can help the customer save time, save costs, save on personnel and a lot of different other things that we really can help our customers with. Absolutely. Now, you, you, you're, you're harping on a word that's very dear to my heart when you say services, because services are a lot of times they're, they're not tangible, you know, and, and from the, the service background that I come from, from the motor service world, you have to you have to have a way to make it a tangible you know, item for that end user. You know, for us, we were doing motor reliability on motors or we were repairing motors, whatever it was. But at the end of the day, we had to give that end user something to understand, you know, where that, where that funds were going and, and how to improve their process. So from a failure analysis standpoint, what type of information are you getting back from the, the, the partners that you work with on the failed components? And how is that relayed to the customer and then how are they using that information to improve their process if you can kind of help me you know close that whole full circle of life if you will for a for a component how does how does that play out Absolutely. It's a great question, Chris. And I'll hopefully on really like a 10,000 foot view, I hope to kind of go over this as a, a very gener- generic overview, but kind of help you understand how we help our customers. Um, we want to be known um, in the industry. It's not just a repair house to try to collect as many broken parts and just get them repaired as fast as possible in the cheapest, effective way to get back to the customer. We want to be able to provide reliability solutions and to be able to provide solutions that a customer can depend on and actually be able to analyze. So one of the things that we do and part of the process is this is why cataloging and be able to track these parts are so important. One of the things that we do in my service area uh, is we will actually track all the parts that we repair for the customer. Um, And we can actually track that all the way down to the machine that it comes out of whether it is a a board, whether it's a motor, whether it's a drive, um, whatever it may be, we can actually track exactly that part, where it came from, from the facility and why it failed. Uh, We have some pretty neat analytics and graphical tools that we use on a quarterly basis to meet with our repair customers, where we can actually show not just a list or a number of how many total repairs, that we actually had done, we can actually go down on a granular level and actually let them know groupings. For example, we can let them know that there was 13 drives that repaired or that were actually needed to be repaired of last quarter. These are 13 drives that all came off the same line in the facility, which would actually denote that there's actually an issue on that line that may need to be looked at on why that drive is failing so much because the other lines have all their drives up and running. So we try to do that failure analysis and that component analysis with each of our customers. And we do that on a quarterly basis. Um, So we utilize software to be able to track and catalog all of our different pieces that we repair. And with that, we also offer our customers um, something that's very coveted in the industry, which is what we call an in-service warranty. And we utilize that software to also be able to track that part when it goes into the machine instead of just giving them a standard warranty where a lot of times that part will just sit on the shelf for years without being used and the warranty will expire. Right, right. Well, hats off to you. It sounds like you got the process down and you're bringing a lot of value. That, and this is the piece that so many service providers miss 
is you know helping that end user understand what happened, what we found, what they can do from a preventative standpoint to improve the process, you know, down in the future to keep that from happening again. So I think you probably just perked the ears of a lot of reliability engineers out there who haven't even thought about this component of a process in a in an industrial environment. So uh, you know, hats off to you. Hopefully that does get circled to the reliability type groups um, inside industrial plants because I, I know they could definitely utilize that type of information. So thank you so much for that. So as we keep talking through services, let's talk about maybe some headwinds you know that industrial end users have if they're trying to make their best decision on, on supporting services. What, what would those headwinds be? Definitely, I think budgets are always going to play a role with each of our different customers in the industrial space. Um, with the definite economic times that we're going through at this time, with all of us having to do more with less, especially with some of the economic factors that we've had to deal with in 2020, we're going to see that budgets are going to be more and more constrained. So there is going to have to be ways for those buyers, those purchasers, and those customers to be able to find economical ways to be more reliable inside the facility, but also save money. And one of the actual ways and best ways that you can do that is really having an original OEM repair that's truly repaired and remanufactured like new from a reputable repair house, whoever you may use, and to ensure that you have the warranty to be able to back up that repair to ensure that it stays in service. Uh, But definitely the, the budgets are going to be top of mind over the next couple of years that we're going to see. Um, and that's really going to drive a lot of business and repairs we see as a huge growth opportunity for all repair houses as customers look to save money, uh, where instead of buying new, they can save money by getting the same part with the same warranty as a repair and remanufactured item. No doubt. No doubt. Now, with that, though, opens up another box that you have to be concerned with if you're an industrial end user. If you're out there and you're and you're in charge of sourcing this material, there's things called the gray market. And, and Daniel, if you can kind of walk us through from a gray market standpoint, uh, you know, tie that into the remanufactured product here. Absolutely. Uh, The gray market is one of the biggest concerns that I see for the future uh, for all industrial customers. Um, The gray market is where you can go through an unauthorized seller, someone that may have actually gotten that part from an old factory, someone that has that part that may not even work. That's what we refer to as the gray market. It's an unauthorized seller of a part. And with that, we have the biggest concern for that over the next few years. Uh, The reason is this, is what we've seen is a lot of these parts are not reliable. They've been in machines that have been run too long and too hard. And a lot of these components and parts have been worn and they're not made to last on what they should and they're not dependable so a lot of our customers will see that they can save a few dollars for a lot of these gray market areas by buying a part from a gray market instead of a reliable source but what we're seeing with reliability is is they're just not getting the reliability that they need from their parts that they used to when they were buying them from a reputable source i really just encourage everyone to do as much research as they can on their sellers and where our buying and purchasing agents for our industrial customers are buying their parts from it's crucial for them to be able to use a reputable source to be able to get their parts that are dependable i won't give any names but we had a customer that uh is a worldwide customer that everyone knows, and they provide uh, drinking and uh, water solutions for a variety of different customers uh, across the world. And they were actually buying a lot of their parts on the gray market. Um, And what we found is they actually bought their part from another country. And we actually found that there was malware on the actual part that they had purchased from the gray market that was actually stealing line information as they were producing their product and was actually being transmitted back to a competitor who was trying to steal trade secrets. So it's a huge issue in the industry that we see, and we want to make sure that all of our customers are protected, regardless of what brands and products you buy. We want to make sure that it's from a reputable source that is authorized to sell that product. We don't want any customers taken advantage of by the gray market and being taken advantage to try to save a few dollars and potentially being down and causing millions of dollars in loss in business. 
No doubt, man. I mean, security, when you were walking through that, the thing that kept coming to the front of my mind was security. You know, how is security going to be impacted, you know, could be impacted by going to the gray market? And then you went to that story. I'm like, well, there you go. That, that's that's your breach right there. So, I mean, it, outside of just basic reliability, which I think most people probably think of that, right? Just the component, the hardware. But there's so many things. We're talking smart devices and very connected plants. In a connected enterprise now, everything you know, data is being pushed out. I mean, we're talking about remote connectivity is is the new norm. So you got to make sure that you're putting in good, reliable equipment. So you know, hats off to you. And 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 one note I forgot to to kind of mention at the beginning of this, we're actually recording this right in in the midst of COVID. So Daniel, how is COVID impacting your on-site services and your vendor supply and inventory programs? The biggest changes that we've seen, Chris, is really on-site procedures and really the PPE that we have to go through, um, otherwise known as personal protective equipment. With that, we see that different segments and different industries are now having new procedures that have to be followed. I'm in an, I've been very, very lucky to be in a position to be an on-site service specialist where I am still able for the vast majority of our customers to be able to go on-site, to be able to walk the floor, and to be able to meet um, with engineers as needed. But with that, we've seen the PPE requirements dramatically change. Just to give you a few examples, we have some customers that actually require a temperature check before you're admitted on site at the guard shack. They will actually scan your temperature um, and ensure that you have a temperature that's 104 or under. With that, we actually have some customers that have required us to be able to ensure that we have hand sanitizers in all of our vans and trucks and that we temperature check as a company all of our employees every morning to ensure that their temperature is in line, that they don't have a fever, uh, that they don't have any type of sickness, whether it be a bacterial or viral infection. Um, but the PPE is dramatically changing um, at each of our customers, and we're seeing that. Um, we're seeing a lot of our signage companies coming out with all of these new social distancing signs that many, many companies are taking forth. I've been very, very impressed with how fast companies have taken to the fact of what social distancing is, that we need to practice that, that we need to not shake hands, that we need to not hug, that we need to stay six feet apart at least, um, and to be able to do those things. We have many signage uh, vendors that we work with now that are selling these signs that are already going out to our customers that are ensuring that all employees remain six feet apart, that they remind them that they actually have to wash their hands every hour um, and remove themselves from the plant floor just to keep everything as clean as possible. Uh, But that's some of the things that I'm seeing with our customers in a post-COVID era uh, that we're really having to make sure to follow those social distancing guidelines that the CDC has given us and also ensure sure that all of our employees and our products are safe. No doubt. Now, you you also have the advantage. You, you travel such a large territory. You see a, so many different types of manufacturing environments. You get to see kind of best practices, if you will, across a multitude. And, and our listeners, a lot of them, they're working in you know specific plants or specific verticals. They don't have that opportunity. Would, would there be any advice or recommendations of best practices that you've seen post-COVID? You know, we're in the midst of it now, of what's going on of, from an industrial end user standpoint that you would highly recommend to, to our listeners because they, they may not have that, you know, what you have seen implemented in their plant. And this is a great opportunity to, to, to share that knowledge. Absolutely. There is. There's a couple best practices that I've seen that I've been incredibly impressed with, and they really involve around two things. Um, We have um, some customers that have really pulled strings, that have really pulled their resources together to ensure that they have hand sanitizer and hand washing station guidelines for all of their employees. Um, Some of the best things that you can do is ensuring that whenever customers have to touch something, whenever employees have to touch anything in the facility, that they have a procedure that once they're done, whether they're building a, um, you know, an actual part or an actual um, equipment or whether they're actually just working on a line, that they have proper hand washing procedures and hand sanitizer available. That after they're done, they ensure that they do that to be able to eliminate contamination. The other um, best practice that I've seen is we understand that some customers, there's nothing that you can do. You're going to be around people and you're going to be very, very close. 
but at all uh, availability, we've we're, I've seen that it's worked and it's been very successful is with social distancing. Um, to have at least six feet, I have one customer that requires 10 feet distance between everyone, and that includes even in the office area, um, whether even with the accountants, whether you're working on the floor in the production as an engineer or reliability specialist. Um, those are my two recommendations is that to have good hand washing um, and hand sanitizer solutions to be able to keep your hands clean and free of any germs and also to be able to keep yourself away from other contact uh, while you're working on the floor or even in the office setting. Yeah, no doubt, man. It makes you wonder, will, you know, will we ever go back? You know, social distancing may be here for good, you know, so just you, you never know. But it's if for right now, it's definitely a best practice. And, and you mentioned the hand sanitizer and, and that uh, washing hands, no doubt. So, so Daniel, we, we always like to, to kind of wrap up our eco ask why episodes with talking about the why and the purpose. So if you could maybe summarize for our listeners out there, why industrial end users uh, should consider out, outside support services, what would that be? Sure. Um, and one of the, the whys is, is that we, um, at my distributorship or regardless of any um, outside services that come in is we provide often free services that help provide efficiency, save costs, save time and save our customers money. We want to be able to provide these services to be able to provide those benefits to our customers so that there's always a cost benefit analysis that we're always going to save them more time and more money than they ever could think. Um, And that's the why is that we're trying to make our customers more competitive in the industry and to be able to do more with the resources they have available. We always want our customers to be successful and to be able to be better than their competition. And that's our job is to ensure that our customers are ready for the future so that they can compete in a global industry going forward. Daniel, thank you so much for walking us through that why and, and, and connecting the dots for our listeners. You brought a ton of value today. I really appreciate all the insights you, you brought, really making people think about these services and how it impacts the plant and things that they should consider. So, again, thank you for your time. and I really appreciate it. My pleasure, Chris. If anyone has any questions or anything about any of the statements I made, I'd be glad to talk about it offline. All right. Have a great day. Thank you for listening to Eco Ask Why. This show is supported ad-free by Electrical Equipment Company. Eco is redefining the expectations of an electrical distributor by placing people and ideas before products. Please subscribe and share with your colleagues and friends. Also, leave comments, feedback, and any new topics that you would like to hear. To learn more or to share your insights, visit EcoSY.com. That's E E C O. A-S-K-S-W-H-Y dot com.